with with the media, the future of democracy and international relations. So it, it's evolved from a conversation that we had the three of us and with uh, a couple of others uh, about um, the general phenomenon that we want to see addressed here, which is really about the media and the internet, which in terms of recent um, tensions between uh, Russia and its neighbors to the West um, and the United States has these things have figured very largely and so the kind of general question I guess that was on our mind as we started uh, talking about this was is there something that's going on uh, in the media internet sphere that is making things worse between nations but it's uh, impossible to take that too very far without wondering um, about what's going on within countries as well. So I think you'll agree this is quite general, but rather than, uh, you know, sometimes when we have uh, are organizing an event like this, you start with a general problem and then you negotiate with your participants to converge on some particular aspect of it. And what we concluded this time was that it was better to just uh, have our two participants talk about what's on their minds as they think about this general phenomenon. And then we'll have a conversation after that in which we'll see how much convergence in fact takes place. So that's the general plan. So this is very lightly guided conversation between two very uh, smart people with, with quite different backgrounds, but with a lot of overlaps in terms of their interests. So Sophie Shevardnadze, uh, whose name is misspelled in this summary, uh, is a television and radio uh, journalist in Russia. She uh, is a radio show host, an op-ed writer, uh, an interviewer for Russia's leading magazines and a public figure in her own country and in Europe. Uh, for the last five years, she's hosted her own uh, program, Sophie Co, on Russia's uh, RT channel, International uh, Network, uh, interviewing prominent politicians and newsmakers from around the world. Uh, she's also co-hosted co two radio shows on Echo of Moscow, Echo Moscow, which is one of the last uh, remaining independent media resources in Russia. And one of the first times the two of us met actually was when uh, I appeared on one of those radio shows in what seemed to be the middle of the night, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it was, it was really it, late. It was extremely <laughs> dark and cold out there. Um, and she's involved in a lot of other activities. As you'll guess from her name, she is indeed related to uh, uh, Gorbachev's foreign minister and, uh, and later the president of independent Georgia, Edward Shevardnadze, who was her grandfather. Um, it so happened that she lived in a variety of kind of series of countries, uh, including Soviet Georgia, France, uh, the United States and Russia. And so she seemed really very well qualified to help us think through some of these questions. And we're so grateful that she was willing to come all this way. Uh, professor Baum uh, is a prof uh, the Marvin Taub Professor of Global Communications and Professor of Public Policy at the Kennedy School. Uh, Marvin Taub is a name that uh, not everybody here perhaps will recognize at this point, but he was a great uh, TV journalist uh, in his day. And um, he was, I believe, one of the small group that opened NBC News's first bureau in Moscow in the 1950s. And he used to tell stories, because he taught at the Kennedy School for years, about uh, how Khrushchev, in those days, the distance between the leaders and the press corps was very slight, and it, he would actually host the American and uh, European journalists and East European journalists for drinks uh, after a central committee meeting. Um, and so uh, Matt is, uh, works with a variety of uh, theoretical and applied um, uh, uh, research projects and, and topics, and he has had among his recent works a book called Soft News Goes to War, something else called uh, Imaginatively War Stories, and then War and Democratic Constraint, How the Public Influences Foreign Policy. So we're gonna start with our guest, uh, Sophie, and, uh, and then move on to Matt, and then have a conversation after. All right. Right, so, so thanks, Tim. Um, I'm really glad to be here, guys. Um, so ever since I've been asked to say what's on my mind, I'm just going to go ahead and do that. Um, I think it's much more important uh, instead of sort of engaging with this ideological debate, because that's what we see uh, around a lot, just to maybe try to give you a perspective of an average Russian and what that feels like in the midst of this back and forth uh, Cold War bashing in the media, and not only. Um, and having said that, um, you know, Tim just gave uh, an overview of my background. I'm not Russian. I'm just a Russian citizen, and you know, I have on many aspects opposing views with the Russian government, especially on foreign policy, because hey, I'm Georgian. Uh, but you know, I love the country, and I ache for it. And um, I understand 
what an average Russian feels like looking at things and that are that, that are going on right now. So let me start with the media. And um, I need to take you a little bit back in time, so bear with me, so that you have a full understanding of why Russia's media is the way it is right now and what is so different from the Western media, and especially from the American media. So it first appeared in the times of Peter the Great, and I'll tell you why that's important, because that is when the church started to lose its influence, okay? And so media sort of uh, started to take over this function of uh, ideological impact and influence over the educated people, right? Um, the press had this um, idiocratic function. It took on the role of sort of civil church in terms of preaching. Um, so if you compare it to the Western media, Russia's media was never first and foremost aimed at investigating or reporting, you know, but much rather preaching. And you know things haven't changed that much ever since. But that was the original role, and that's the way things sort of uh, rolled out after that. Um, keep in mind that when you know American nation was starting to form, uh, people who formed it um, lived with free press for more than a century. I mean, it was a fabric of your society, and it was given to you. Not the same thing in Russia. So then the revolution saw the end of the monarchy, but not the notion of media as a preacher because Soviets wanted to educate people, right? Um, and using the press to inform people about the rules and principles of the new life. And that's why what we call, pro I, mean, we, I mean the Soviets call it propaganda, uh, it was taken really seriously. Much more seriously than in other countries because in other countries propaganda is just laughed at, you know? It, it would never be taken seriously. Like, at large, you know, the Soviet uh, people would believe everything that was written in the newspaper. I mean, the written word is just so important to their culture. You know, there's a saying in Russia that a poet is more than a poet, and it, I think it's also true for a journalist. A journalist is, you know, more than a journalist in Russia. Um, so media was looked at as something that gives you the normal life and defines it. And this whatever I told you also coincides with this um, other important cultural code, which is moral demand. I mean, with the Russians, things that you say, right, are uh, rarely just objective or neutral. I mean, they have to be accompanied with a personal moral assessment and preferably like a philosophical twist to it. Um, everything in Russia has to be founded in ideology, right? Everything is aggravated by emotional or moral attitude. That's the way Russians are. And this is to say that not only historically, Russian media has this sort of a ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical, yeah, that's a tongue breaker function. But, you know, on top of that, you know, the Russian people and just the way they are, uh, the consciousness, uh, they look for what's behind the fact rather than just looking at sheer facts. Um, and then there's another important cultural factor. Um, and that is that within Russia, ever since the Romanov times, there has always been this um, divide, ideological conflict between the so-called Westerners, there were also always a minority, and then the Slavophiles, who believed in Russia's unique cultural or civilizational identity, and who have always been very suspicious of all things Western, and Western influence of Russian culture, and who defied and doubted and challenged the Western model of existence. Um, as I've said, you know, they've traditionally um, are the majority, even though I have to say that they didn't always have the decisive influence on the government and the way it worked. So what's happening in Russian media today, I think very much reflects this centuries old conflict. You know, today it's perhaps even more relevant than before because of the experience of the 90s. I mean, I don't know if you're aware that uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, you know, Russians got for a little bit, this Western-like free press. And you can pretty much say whatever you wanted. Um, but that really uh, quickly turned into chaos, I would argue, you know, because what we found was this total unreadiness to cope with it, to cope with the freedom, to cope with the democracy, uh, the Western ideals. And uh, I would say it pretty much stemmed from being misinformed about freedom and that maybe freedom comes with a whole lot of responsibility because, you know, Russians never had that before. So, yeah, you could say whatever you wanted for a little bit, and the press was completely free, but that soon turned into war between oligarchs and big corporations and politicians, and journalism pretty much became a good trade. So then came Putin, and this 
conservative U-turn, I'd say, in all levels, whether it's political or in the society or in the media. But I'd argue that contrary to what West may think, this was pretty much an organic response to the top of the clear demand of the bottom. I mean, I would say the audiences, if you wish, to sort of restore this law and order, pay more attention to national interests rather than, you know, necessity to being westernized. And so this chaotic and often criminal freedom uh, of the 90s reemerged. Uh, so the emergence of the national self-awareness of the majority and the picture in the Russian media today, I think, rather objectively reflects the political reality, the political views of the Russian society. You know, just a few percent, I'd say, of Russian population today in Russia subscribe to Western values. A majority of nations really do share those conservative Russian views that people don't seem to know, understand, or like in the West, but no, that's the way it is. Now, can I tell you something? I'm certainly not here in Harvard to make a case for Russia's free press. I mean, that would be silly. But to say that there is no free press in Russia whatsoever, or no diversity of opinion, you know, it's simply not true. And it's just not fair, because yeah, I worked at Echo Moskwe, which is a, a legend from Perestroika times, and there is TV Rain, which is a full-on opposition channel, and you have, you know, some uh, really solid liberal-minded print newspapers, quite a bit of liberal opposition-minded resources online. Over 50 million Russians are connected on internet and very active, so don't be fooled. Don't think that they're not informed and that they're all, like, brainwashed, you know? So, um, I feel like the things, the way they are standing today, um, the potential audience for the ideas of Western liberalism is just smaller, considerably smaller than views of the majority. I just want to illustrate this with um, Ksenia Sobchak. I mean, I don't know, if, I, I think you probably all know who she is, right? She's the daughter of the great mayor of St. Petersburg who was assassinated. He was a great man, great Democrat. Um, she, uh, for a while, was a socialite, then turned a serious journalist, and now she's running for president. I mean, so I would argue that she's a Kremlin project, but that doesn't really matter because in Russia, everyone's a Kremlin project to a certain extent. Putin is also a Kremlin project. The bottom line is, she's running this brilliant Western-like presidential campaign. Okay, like, I think if she was running here, like, she would win in a heartbeat. Um, I mean, she got... Um, she was on CNN of Amapur and on BBC, and she got access to all of the major networks outside Russia. But she's also, for the past two months, every day on live network televisions in Russia. She's standing there debating this like weird old man from different parties that have been running for 20 years for presidents. And she really says things that people haven't heard in the longest time, like sensible things to the, to, to the Western perspective, like things that you know all the opposition members would argue. Uh, but the point is, but the point is, and, and, and people watch her and the ratings are crazy and everyone's hearing her. The point is, according to the polls, and I'm talking about international polls, she's hardly hitting 5%. So that's just to illustrate this example of how much people really prescribe to those kind of views right now in Russia. I mean, that that's my personal opinion. I could be wrong. Of course, not everyone likes Putin. Of course, not everyone likes what's going on in the country. And it's by far not a perfect system. Uh, but right now they feel like this is better than what was before because it was scary and unknown and it didn't quite work out and it was like one experiment after another, Soviet Union collapsed and you know all of a sudden they've been told that oh it was all a lie, everything you believed in and then the 90s. So this, whatever is going on right now, um, I feel like they feel more comfortable with the majority of the Russian. And then you know there is also like um, Try to understand what I'm going to say. There is this centuries-old divide between the Greek Orthodox and the Catholic Church, right? So when that happened, Russians retained that Orthodox identity that, you know, sort of uh, opposed uh, whatever was Western Catholic, and that is in their historic DNA. And that ref resurfaces every time there is an escalation between West and Russia, and especially what that happens in the media. You know, it's sort of a civilization metrics, if you will. Um, and now with this confrontation, uh, media is really active. And um, I would say that it, whatever reaction you get from Russian people and, and from the Russian media, it not, it's not by Putin's whim. It's really much more than that. It goes much deeper than just what people might think that you know Putin is the one who owns all the media in Russia and tells people what to think.
Uh, it goes way back. That's what I would argue. Um, and you know, also, I feel like a lot of Russians are like, you know, I don't think we're getting a fair deal because they look at the US press because compared to Americans, Russians watch American network channels and those who speak English and people who speak English and Russian. They're like, you know, why is that like that China, who has like a one party system, communism, like literally no elections, literal gulag, internet restrictions. I mean, the guy is just elected lifetime president forever until he dies. Or I don't know, Saudi Arabia that, you know, stones women uh, when they uh, cheat on their husbands or behead people on like public squares, doesn't get any criticism at all in the American media. But then all of a sudden, like Russia is the most backward country in the world. Um, and you know they they they're just like why 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 is because the, there's no reason for that kind of double standard and the Russian would argue and yet it's pretty much there and because we we may not be a perfect democracy we definitely aren't but I mean we have far more democracy than those two countries that I just gave you an example of you know so um, I may actually understand why Americans feel like they want Russians to be like them because they look at us, right? And like from way back, yeah, we're also of European origins and we look the same. We don't look Chinese and we don't look Saudi, so we look the same. And so America's like, why aren't you like us? I mean, why aren't you acting like us? And why don't you see things the way we see things? Well, that's because of the very different culture and cultural codes that I've mentioned. And, you know, um, America is a very young country, okay guys, so born as democracy as a result of war of independence and born certain ideals expressed in Declaration of Independence, Bill of Rights, Constitution, all these wonderful things and all these wonderful ideals, you know, written by your neighbors. Russia, on the other hand, is a country that has gone through a much slower revolution process and much slower process, a dangerous process of coming into existence, you know, the external dangerous pushing it into the centralized authoritarian past since the Middle Ages. I mean, the Tatar and Mongol ego, seriously, like 300 years of being completely excluded from the world processes, you know, it really pays its toll, trust me. And then we had slavery just like Americans, but like compared to the Americans, we wouldn't bring people from other countries. I mean, these slaves were our own people, just so we understand, you know, the, the cultural difference. And then you had the Soviet Union, right? And this experiment where people were allowed to believe that they're gonna be living in this ideal fair society. And so many people actually paid their lives because they believed in it. And one day they woke up and they've been told, oh, you know what? This all has been a terrible mistake and a lie. And then the 90s that I mentioned, right? That were like really tough on people and pretty much broke, almost broke the country on many levels, I would argue. Um, so, I feel like Russia needs time and America often lacks patience when Russians say that because you guys, I mean, whoever is American, you are born with this feeling of democracy inside you because democracy is something you cannot decree from top. It's not like you come and you announce, well, from right on, you're going to be democratic and that's the way things work. Democracy is the way you see life and feel life and relate to things, you know, and it was given to you this sense of inner freedom. You're born with it. Russians never had that. I mean, most of the Russians, Russian population and people in power are people who went to Soviet schools and finished Soviet universities. You know, it's a huge country, very complex and proud people, and they have their own inner rhythm of moving towards different ideals and democracy. I mean, they can't be just like snap out of it and not just be like us, so that's not happening. It's gonna take generations. It's, it's gonna take a while. Um, so, um, I mean, you out of all people should know because Americans tried to do it in Iraq and in Vietnam and in Kosovo, it doesn't work overnight, especially for a huge country like Russia. It's 145 million people. Um, I feel like America is a country that's very prone to uh, being, how should I say it so it doesn't sound moralistic, um, 
ethnocentric and there is nothing wrong about being ethnocentric. Russians are ethnocentric too, but as far as long as we acknowledge that, you know, you need to learn how to look out of that loop to see why other person is different and why other person reacts the way it reacts. You can't just apply arbitrary standards to all nations and expect them to act like you and if they don't then, you know, they're you know, automatically labeled the bad guys. It's not serious, guys. You know, uh, and I also feel like um, whenever I look at the American media, sort of putting this huge Russian breathing populace and taking it and bringing it out to one man, which is Putin, and saying that all that nation is just a nation of brainwashed sheep who worship Putin is very insulting to Russians. You know, I mean, as I've said, not many Russians, and there are a lot of Russians who don't like Putin, but the majority do for whatever reason, or for reasons that, you know, um, I've said in my speech earlier. So, you know, like all nations, the old nations with a lot of complexes, um, we tend to get offended when we see that kind of attitude in the media and in general. Um, so I feel like the worst thing that has come out of this thing is the relationship on people's level. Because I feel like during the Cold War, it was terrible. But you had, you know, Russians that hated American capitalism or American imperialism. And then you had the Soviets who hated, uh, and the Americans who hated the communism. But it was never on a people's level. I mean, Soviets, you know, they always had this longing for all things Western. Like seriously, Hemingway was a lot of times more popular than Tolstoy in the Soviet times. What you have right now is this negativity uh, taken upon nations and people starting to hate each other. This was something that wasn't there during the Cold War. And I mean, I'd argue that you know, the media is to blame for that much more than politicians. Um, so that's what I wanted to talk about, say about Russia, but just really briefly, just because I, I know you want to talk about the social media and how that impacts uh, our perspective media, and I think it does, because we're fighting this war with social media right now where um, mm -hmm. conventional media or mainstream media is obliged to play by the rules of the social media on its territory, where there are no economic or moral boundaries, so we're kind of becoming like that, and um, with this Cold War bashing between Russia and American media, because of course Russian media does the same. It really very much reacts to whatever American media does, um, in its um, in, in its respect. You know, I feel like playing by the rules of the social media is has made this whole bashing even more obvious and sort of adds to the centrifugal, centrifugal force that drives us further apart. And I feel like it's also laziness because people and media don't want to face the real problems and the real actual challenges that are on the ground, but it's just easier to fall back into that paradigm of the Cold War because, you know, you're used to it. But I feel like it's a bad habit and we need to get rid of it because the world is just not as black and white as media likes to portray it. And unless we see innumerable shades of gray in between, I feel like, you know, it may break and it's a shame. That's it. <laughs> oh, terrific. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so uh, Professor Baum will now tell us what's on his mind. <laughs> okay, so uh, in the spirit of um, uh, thinking about what's on my mind, I thought I I'm going to go in a somewhat different direction. And uh, I, I think maybe postmortem is probably the wrong term, but sort of a retrospective assessment on how the media has done in the last couple of years the, uh, with the tumult that um, the American system, uh, political system has been in the midst of. Um, and so I guess uh, a slightly more parochial presentation than we just heard. So I'd like to talk in particular about uh, what I think of as sort of a paradox in, in recent American journalism. So on the one hand, uh, I think uh, we can say that the U.S. news media um, failed completely to check uh, 
um, and arguably even facilitated the rise to power of a uh, completely inexperienced and arguably unqualified candidate for president who ran on a, uh, a right populist platform that at times bordered on ethno-nationalism, the kind of thing that you wouldn't normally expect to get by the press. Um, now, if you accept those premises, and, and you may not accept those premises, those are my premises, uh, it's hard to conclude that this wasn't an epic failure of the so-called watchdog of democracy on those terms. But on the other hand, uh, over the past year, the media has proven to be a pretty resilient watchdog, certainly checking some, albeit, you know, albeit by no means all, of the Trump administration's most extreme ideas and policy proposals. And it's also brought into the public eye innumerable potential or actual instances of questionable ethical or legal behavior by uh, the Trump administration, ranging from the Russia probes, the firing of John Comey, to $30,000 dining tables, private government military jets for honeymoons, and the list sort of goes on. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, over that period, we've seen a substantial increase or a rebound in public trust in the media, which had reached an all-time low in, 20, in 2016. Um, the president has called the press the enemy of the people. Uh, he's repeatedly threatened journalists with censorship, uh, including threatening the broadcast licenses of major news outlets that were critical of him. Yet to date, the news media have collectively been able to more or less hold their ground without suffering fates similar to some of their counterparts uh, in places like Turkey, the Philippines, and yes, also in Russia to some extent, uh, where leaders of erstwhile democracies with uh, also with some authoritarian tendencies have threatened, sometimes jailed, sometimes even murdered journalists um, with seeming impunity. So the question arises, as to why this paradox has emerged. Why are journalists seemingly incapable of successfully standing up to a, a right-wing populist or someone running on a right-wing populist platform like Donald Trump as a candidate, uh, but doing so seemingly with abandon as president once he's in the White House? What accounts for the difference? And I wanna suggest that the answer is a combination of two factors, or at least two factors, that there are other things as well, but there are two that I want to focus on. The first is that traditional journalistic news values, which uh, provide sort of a standard operating procedure for covering uh, presidential candidates, um, uh, albeit somewhat differently also presidents, um, these news values and the, the uh, news routines that they engender played an important role in uh, Donald Trump's rise. The second uh, is simply the existence of the First Amendment, which continues to enjoy pretty widespread public support among Americans. Freedom of the press garners 70% or so support in most surveys. You might have expected that to be higher, but that's a lot higher than most of the rest of the Bill of Rights. So it sort of stands apart um, by and large. Uh, to date, the First Amendment has largely, although certainly not perfectly, held. So because of the constitutional guarantee of a free press, combined with obviously the still independent judiciary, American journalists are much better situated than their counterparts in places uh, like the countries I mentioned um, to hold their leaders to account, even when the leader openly threatens them with violence uh, or arrest, as Donald Trump has implicitly and some would say explicitly done uh, on more than one occasion. So let me begin by talking a bit about the role of journalistic news values. And there are two uh, criteria for newsworthiness in particular that I wanna focus on, and those are probably familiar to you, novelty and balance. Um, novelty is pretty self-evident. New and surprising information is more interesting than older expected information. Uh, stated differently, the plane took off and <coughs> landed is not news. The plane took off and crashed is news. The plane took off and disappeared over the ocean, as if you remember the Malaysian airline flight 370, is news 24-7 round the clock for months on end. And um, uh, you know, CNN, who I'm thinking of, actually earned their highest ratings in many years by covering that disappearance for nonstop 24-7 for months on end. Balance, on the other hand, simply means that journalists would rather be neutral arbiters, at least uh, mainstream media journalists, covering both sides of any argument equally, almost regardless of the intrinsic merits of one or the other side. 
Uh, so both of these newsworthiness norms have important virtues. Uh, the preference for novel news ensures that journalists are going to privilege issues or information the public didn't already know about, and after all, that's pretty much the definition of news. Balance, which stems from this news value of objectivity, means that journalists have a powerful norm of avoiding taking sides in a political or other debate. Ironically, while a lot of Americans believe the news media are biased, um, and not just the partisan media, but the, the mainstream news media, um, most professional new journalists are heavily imbued with this core journalistic norm of seeking balance in order to avoid the appearance, let alone the reality, of favoring one side or the other. In the context of the 2016 election, novelty helped President Trump and candidate Trump in several key respects. First, his many uh, dramatic and uh, outrageous comments, beginning with equating Mexicans with rapists on the day he announced his campaign, was <coughs> unprecedented in modern American history. Trump continued escalating his shocking and extreme record rhetoric throughout the campaign, ensuring that he remained the most newsworthy candidate day after day. Every day seemed to Trump, pardon the pun, the last in terms of surprising or shocking rhetoric or actions. So take a step back and think about the con contrast between Trump on the one hand in the general election and Hillary Clinton on the other. So on one side, you have a billionaire reality TV star who's never run for office. He promises to build a border wall, ban Muslims, deport 11 million undocumented immigrants, tear up trade deals, fire the, fire the generals, reassess NATO, spread nuclear weapons, he praises dictators, he promises to imprison his opponent, and that's just, you know, a few items. On the other side, you have a heavily favored longtime party insider who promises to build on the uh, then current administration's policies, and in fact previously ran a nearly successful presidential campaign. In terms of novelty, it's not a contest. Trump wins hands down every day. Uh, he consistently earned substantially more news coverage than his rivals uh, from the primaries right through the general election. He earned so much free airtime that he could basically ignore paid advertising through the primaries, and he was outspent dramatically by the Clinton campaign during the general election to no avail. So when novelty got Trump the attention he needed to be competitive, the balance norm ensured that once the general election arrived, he could count on the media playing up both sides' faults to such an extent that innumerable so-called false, equivalence, false equivalencies emerged. One example um, is a, an article that appeared in USA Today in a news column called Trump, Clinton, Both Threaten Free Press. In the article, Trump is called out for calling the press the enemy of the people, for banning news outlets from covering his press conferences and rallies, for using journalists as foils at rallies, for inciting vitriol and arguably even violence against them. So this is all in the article. Then they get to Clinton, and her sin is that she didn't hold a full press conference for around five months. Uh, to my mind, if that's not a false equivalency, a false equivalency then the, the phrase has no meaning. Um, a second example of false equivalency concerns news coverage of the supposed dishonesty of the two candidates. For instance, a, a very widely discussed expose by Politico was headlined, Are Clinton and Trump the Biggest Liars Ever to Run for the Presidency? According to PolitiFact, uh, through the end of the campaign, 70% of all statements by candidate Trump were either false or pants on fire, which is their, you know, five on their one to five scale. The corresponding figure for Clinton was 15%. These figures prompted New York Times columnist Nicholas Crystal to write an opinion piece titled Clinton's Fibs versus Trump's Huge Lies, in which he writes in part, the idea, the idea that they are even in the same league is preposterous. If deception were a sport, Trump would be the Olympic gold medalist, Clinton would be an honorary mention at her local Y. Uh, in fact, to my knowledge, uh, although I'm not completely certain of this, the first time the word lie appeared in a major media outlet uh, referring to uh, Donald Trump was in a September 16th, 2016 New York Times story about Trump's leadership of the birther conspiracy. Um, there were obviously many other factors at play, from Russian hacking to the Comey memo to 
the distrust and even hatred of Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton among many uh, white working class voters. But these two journalistic norms clearly played a significant role. The norms that had long served the press in its coverage of politics simply were not up to the task of covering a candidate like Trump, who was willing to flout virtually all of the norms and traditions of presidential campaigns. Journalists were caught unprepared with no roadmap for dealing with a candidate who was willing to lie and change his mind with impunity, while seemingly offering endless shocking and titillating rhetoric and behavior of a sort that hadn't been heard in American politics, at least since George Wallace, if, uh, if not ever. Um, September 16th, May, uh, 2016, may or may not have been a watershed moment, but soon after the inauguration, the press seemed to regain its balance. It began launching into a seemingly endless array of investigations into malfeasance by Trump and others in his administration. Uh, now, that now, at this point, there are no longer two sides that need to be treated with balance. The media's self-perceived job changed from neutral referee during the campaign to watchdog. So obviously, uh, the Russia probe is the most high profile of these sort of uh, investigations, and there has been expose after expose on that topic, beginning with the Michael Flynn resignation, indictment and plea bargain early in the administration. But there have been many, many other such instances of journalists uncovering questionable, beha questionable behavior by, the, by President Trump himself or administration officials, ranging from cabinet secretaries to members of the president's family to the White House staff. Um, news reports have also uncovered the Trump administration's escalating efforts to end government-related research or policymaking regarding, regarding climate science and clean energy, among other policy areas, and the list goes on. While the president has grown increasingly outraged, lashing out and threatening journalists and media outlets, to date, no journalist has been jailed and no news outlet has lost its FCC license as a consequence of its coverage of the Trump administration. The reason seems pretty clear. The First Amendment's guarantee of a free press, which is uniquely American, make it extremely difficult for the Trump administration to effectively censor the media. Backstopped, uh, and this is an important backstop, by an also constitutionally created and as yet uncowed independent judiciary, the press has to date mostly resisted attempts at censorship or retaliation in response to its reporting on the Trump administration. This contrasts pretty sharply with the fates of journalists and some other uh, semi-authoritarian and authoritarian contexts. contexts. Most notably, I would say, uh, Turkey and the Philippines, where uh, journalists have been imprisoned uh, or murdered. Um, and in some other places, I mean, if you want to talk about authoritarian regimes in China, for instance, uh, only to name a few. Um, so, these sort of, uh, this contrast is stark. Uh, I think, if nothing else, it shows how critical the constitutional guarantee of a free press in the First Amer Amendment is for American democracy. Without all of this information about the Trump administration coming to light, it's unclear how Americans could expect to resist a movement toward authoritarianism if it should emerge. And without a constitutional protection against retaliation, journalists in all likelihood wouldn't be able to resist for very long. In an era of rising far-right nationalism and populism, not obviously not only in the United States, but uh, in quite, enough, quite a few countries, uh, including in Europe, it seems that journalism, when protected from government retaliation, is indeed proving to be a cornerstone, maybe even a foundational cornerstone of democracy. But without that protection, it's unclear whether it's realistic to expect journalists to play that sort of role. Even with it, the verdict is, is out, at least for me anyway, as to whether the current status quo can continue indefinitely. Uh, you know, against sort of continuous, gradual buildup of pressure. But the good news, and I'll just conclude with that, is that so far it seems to have held up pretty well. And okay. the end, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think we, this uh, demonstrates that we made a wise decision to just let each of you uh, speak your minds, and uh, it was very interesting indeed. <clears throat> and uh, I wonder if we can make an effort to pull things together to, to some extent.
So maybe I'll just start with Matt, and I'm, we're just going to ask a couple of questions here, and then we'll open it up to the floor. So um, you have applied your analytical uh, mind today to uh, in domestic affairs mostly, and to American democracy and the First Amendment. Um, in, in terms of how the media is functioning, can you, because you do a lot of work on the media and foreign policy, uh, what's the big picture in terms of how changes in the media sphere, or perhaps that's not the right way to think with certain kinds of continuities, perhaps in the media sphere, relate to foreign policy? Because, uh, and you could speak just about the United States if you like, because clearly there's a lot of flux there as well. And can we say that, uh, is there any, can, can we say that there's any connection between how um, our particular media function uh, and the country's role in the world um, and uh, the chances perhaps for international cooperation and mutual security? This is a rather grand question. Like <laughs> so I'm just going to answer a little piece of this okay. really grand question because I think uh, most of what I said I would generalize to the American press's coverage of foreign policy, um, which has been surprisingly, surprisingly robust after, I would say, decades of retreat and decline um, as uh, the major American uh, press has sort of cut back on covering foreign policy, cut back on foreign bureaus, right. relied more on stringers, you know, uh, nationals who they couldn't always protect, um, been subjected to intense censorship in war coverage, um, indirect, not always direct, but uh, increasingly, uh, an increasingly clever government understanding how to set journalists up, tell them you have no rules, but the, put them in positions where they couldn't really understand what was going on. Uh, but I feel like, uh, uh, for the time being at least, the, I, I would generalize the comments I made in terms of, you know, what this portends going forward, you know, the, I suppose the, the upside is that Americans are, are giving a second look to the value of the fourth estate, you know, um, that, well, okay, uh, uh, the press is actually playing an important role and, you know, subscriptions to the, the major newspapers, for instance, that do offer a lot of foreign policy coverage are through the roof. Uh, places like the New York Times and the Washington Post, um, they've never been better, they've never been healthier than they are right now in terms of uh, uh, both um, print and online uh, subscriptions. And some of those resources mean more and better foreign policy coverage. I think um, uh, it also means um, that American journalism uh, can serve a role that long served, which was sort of a model for uh, the emerging free press in other countries. Um, and you know that sort of uh, was clearly in decline and for the time being may sort of resurge, uh, which is one of the few areas where America is uh, increasingly respected as opposed to greatly diminishing its international respect, you know, is for uh, American journalism. Um, so there is, you know, there's some reason for optimism, but it's optimism born out of, you know, some uh, dramatic badness uh, in, in many ways. So, you know, what will happen when things calm down and uh, we have, you know, if and when we go back to whatever normal politics look like is, uh, is a more difficult question. Okay, so I want to turn to Sophie in a second, but I want to just, if you don't mind, ask a, a follow-up question, which comes out of what Sophie said in her remarks, and that is about the, you know, we've uh, heard so much about the crisis of the conventional print and broadcast media, and uh, the internet as a circulation device that doesn't generate real new information, and journalism as a career of declining attractiveness because it's so uncertain and all that. You referred to the flourishing of these high-value newspapers. Uh, to which I subscribe to, <clears throat> I thought that you know they were about to go broke a couple of years ago, and now it looks like things are going better. But um, is this are we just seeing a temporary uptick, or is this some sign of a real systemic recovery? So uh, yeah, I really haven't, uh, with apologies, said much about uh, online media and social media. And you know this is this is not something you need me to tell you. There's an existential threat to uh, what we've thought of in the I guess since maybe the 1930s as sort of uh, the mainstream journalism, especially in the post-World War II era. Now, you, know, you could make the case that that was uh, sort of an aberration and we've sort of fallen back into some version of what was normal before 
the World War II era, so that's a whole different conversation, though. But uh, in the context of your question, I don't have any uh, particular reason for optimism that if we had normal politics, that this sort of surge and uh, uh, interest in and resources to um, the, uh, the the most uh, sort of prominent news organizations that do most you know the most high value investigative journalism will would persist because you know when when people aren't under threat they'd rather do other things than read about politics and foreign policy for the most part especially Americans Americans really don't want to think about the world you know, most of the time and they only you know I mean uh, you know in fact the more uh, I can't remember who said this recently but. Uh, uh, but I read this not long ago that um, one sign that a democracy is in trouble is when people are talking about politics all the time. <laughs> um, and so that's great for uh, you know the major newspapers and the major networks, uh, but it's maybe not so great for democracy. Um, uh, and you know, the online uh, sort of online news and social media. Um, there's, you know, we could have a very long conversation about that, but just sticking within the broader topic of what I was presenting, I would say uh, uh, it's a boon. You know, having that presence is, has been a boon to uh, the larger news outlets right now, not so much for regional and local news outlets, um, by the way. Uh, it's, but that's a double-edged sword because as soon as the urgency goes away, we're probably going to go back to you know what you were describing, which is this sort of spiral of where do we make money and, and uh, how do we maintain eyeballs? How do we keep them from uh, focusing on celebrity gossip, which is much more fun? Great. Okay. Very good. So, Sophie, could we just return then to what you were saying about the contest between? Uh, the conventional media and uh, the new media in in Russia. You're saying that it's affected how uh, more conventional outlets uh, behave. Maybe you could tell us a bit more about that. And also, um, since I asked, uh, referred to journalism as a career, how do Russians today, a generation after the Soviet collapse and entering into this new era, uh, having gone through the 90s with the crazy freedom and all that stuff, uh, how would the young Russians today uh, think about going uh, into a career in journalism or in the media? Is it an attractive thing to do or, or not? Um, I think a lot of Russians are very attracted to the idea of being on TV and being famous and um, much more than you know being actually um, a journalist who would risk their lives. Having said that, having said that, from the 90s there's a great school of investigative journalism and bunch of great journalists who risked their lives doing amazing work in Chechnya or like in all these North Caucasus uh, republics and doing investigative work on all the dirty wars between the oligarchs and the corporations and a lot of the journalists who were killed actually were killed in the 90s. That's right. Not in the Putin era. Um, we have numbers on that. I think, I think young people who are going into this profession, you know, a little confused maybe as to what journalism is because uh, you have one thing right now in Russia, um, and that is the general consensus of the public who is very traditional and cherishes Russian values, and that just goes hand in hand with whatever the mainstream media in Russia uh, gives out. And then you know, have you young people who are in the internet and uh, speak English and um, read all these news that come out from the West, and they see the difference and how the news is actually tailored in a different way uh, than what Russia has right now. Um, my guess is they're trying to find this hybrid path of what would work for Russia. Hybrid. Yeah. Because very curious, uh, the young generation, I, I do a lot of lectures in um, GAU and like people who are like first or second year Jor Jorpa. journalists. Yeah, and they're very curious about how to be a journalist in Russia and what's the best way to be because I feel like there's no answer right now because um, that partisan journalism, like in the way we understand it in the West, um, is not there, but there's no demand for it. So they don't understand. And also another really important factor in, in, in Russian press today, much more than censorship, is self-censorship. That's much bigger of a factor and much more dangerous. And so those young people are trying to figure out how to get rid of that, how to find ways to say things that really are on your mind, 
um, and what are the right forms for that? I don't know if I answered that question. Yeah, sure. All right, very good. So, thank you. Um, so let's just see what kinds of questions we have. Perhaps if you wouldn't mind, just say who you are for our, our two speakers. So um, yeah, do we have a microphone here? Or, uh, please. Uh, 